Hi, this is Billy Tarasio with the Modern Divorce Podcast, joined again today by Ryan Claridge. Ryan, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Always, always good to have you. Today, we're going to talk about the fun and interesting topic of when do you have a right to an attorney? When do you need an attorney? When are you okay to represent yourself? And when can you use a paralegal to assist you? This is obviously something that comes up a lot. And um, Ryan, you've recently had a couple experiences with this that has kind of led us to have this conversation. Yes, I have. I mean, often in, consul- often in consultations or even in the pre-consultation, people are asking, you know, do they need an attorney for a particular situation? Um, sometimes I've had consultations where people, you know, assume they need an attorney, they talk to an attorney, um, and the attorney tells them, you know, you don't have a legal problem, um, nothing that your, your soon-to-be ex or your ex or your neighbor is doing uh, is actually enforceable. So you don't actually get the fun of hiring an attorney. So there are situations where you don't need an attorney at all. Yeah, it's true. It's true. And knowing that beforehand and figuring out what's a legal problem versus what is a different type of problem and what are my other remedies is not always easy. So let's start with um, Miranda warnings. Everyone has heard you have the right to remain silent um, and then, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be provided for you. Um, when does that apply? That only applies, uh, when you are being arrested or when you are, um, facing criminal charges. Um, we've all heard it on law and order and cops. Uh, but if you remember that's only in, um, only in criminal proceedings. So the right to remain silent, the right to um, an attorney, those things only trigger uh, if your liberty is at stake, if you're being if you're being interviewed or prosecuted for something, something criminal in nature. So there is no right to an attorney in any other area of law, um, with some exceptions. But generally, it's only it's only criminal law. So family law, our world, there there is no right to an attorney. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. One of those exceptions is if DCS is trying to take your kids. That is another circumstance where you might be, you would be provided um, an attorney to represent you because of course, you know, having your kids taken away is, is such a huge deal. Now, many people in family court face the same thing. And many people have argued that there should be some sort of a right to legal counsel in family court but there isn't. And you as a pro per is what we call it in Arizona, where you're representing yourself, you are held legally to the same standard as, as an attorney, which can be very, very difficult. And yet 80% of people in family court generally do represent themselves. So this decision of figuring out when you can represent yourself is really, really tough. And so in general, Ryan, when do you think people need an attorney? I think in family law, maybe more than any other area of law, it's it's the most emotional area of law, right? Um, not only is it a court of equity, so feelings and fairness are important, but something deeply personal to the litigant, right? It's, it's their kids, it's their, it's their life savings. So I always think you need an attorney when you cannot, uh, you know, emotionally separate um, from the from the case at hand. And the law, you know, is relatively black and white, but you know, our personal lives, our, our, our marriages are, are, are not. So I don't think that anyone should really be their own attorney if there's anything that's contested, especially in family law, because it's just so hard to separate the, the fact from the emotion. Uh, that's part of the reason you hire an attorney. I mean, they are, they listen to all your emotions and then they translate them. They, they tell you, you know, which things are important to tell the judge, which things aren't relevant. So yeah, the filtering is so hard. You're you're absolutely right. You know, um, you you have such a small window of opportunity to tell your story, and figuring out which part of your story to tell is one of the most difficult things. Right, and that's one of the most productive things in talking to an attorney. A lot of times, the things that the clients think are not important are very important, and it can be very helpful. And then a lot of times, there's just things that are, um, you know, they they matter in the grand scheme of things, but to the judge who has a very limited uh, amount of time, like you said, you know, don't matter as much. So I would say in family law, the only time or 
you probably don't need an attorney if you understand what's happening and there's no there's no uh, dispute. So if you're you know getting divorced and everyone agrees it's going to be 50 50 parenting time, we're dividing everything in half, um, then you're probably not going to go into an adversarial proceeding. You're probably going to proceed by consent decree. So you don't need an attorney to represent you in court. What you might want to do is prepare the documents yourselves or have a document prepare prepare documents for you and then have an attorney just look them over and make sure um, maybe the other party isn't trying to trick you, but maybe there's just a mistake that'll save both parties some time and some aggravation down the road. So that's the situation. Absolutely. I think that's a great point. You know, if you are not needing to go to court because the two of you agree on everything and, and the paperwork's done properly, then you probably don't need an attorney. Right. The other possible um, situation is you are going to court, but the other party is not going to show up. At that point, you probably don't need an attorney. Correct, correct. Um, I would say the other situation where you do not need an attorney, um, I deal with this you know, not infrequently, um, I'll be in a consultation and the potential client is telling me that you know, the opposing party is gonna call the police on me if I do this or I don't do this. Um, and a lot of times the threat to call the police is something that's not, uh, the family law can't touch, uh, something that is governed by the, already governed by the decree. So I'll call the police if you let, you know, your, your parents, you know, the ex-in-laws, the outlaws now watch the kids. Well, that's probably not, um, if you're not divorced yet, that is definitely not uh, counter to the law. Uh, if you are divorced and it's not spelled out in your decree, that certain people cannot watch the children, assuming they're safe people, have driver's licenses and no you know, criminal record and not, aren't using substances, the police might not even come. And if they do, they'll ask for the divorce decree, maybe. Um, and if there's nothing in there that is you know, against the decree, then there's nothing in there against the law. And that's, that's really a hollow threat. Now, the person threatens to call the police over and over and over again, and then you had a consultation and I told you, sorry, you, well, congratulations, you don't need my help. Um, maybe the avenue is you file an order of protection to stop the harassment, the fear of calling the police. But you know, even there, you probably don't need an attorney um, maybe until the actual hearing itself. Yeah, absolutely. Do I need a lawyer if my spouse has one? I would say that's probably that's probably uh, true, but unfortunately true. Um, you do not want to. Now it depends what what the attorney was hired for. You might get a call from your soon to be ex spouse uh, from an attorney's office, and it might be that attorney saying, "Hey, look, your wife is here, your husband is here, uh, but they would actually like to take a collaborative approach." So just so you know, I've been meeting with your soon to be ex spouse for about twenty minutes as long as you're willing to kind of waive that and, and I can, that attorney can assert you that he's going to represent both of you and just preparing the documents or maybe being your mediator, um, then you can actually use the same attorney as your spouse. It's rare, but they're, it's not that rare. Um, there are lots of mediators who are also attorneys that do that. If it's an adversarial process, uh, if you thought things were going smoothly or maybe you knew they weren't going smoothly and another attorney has been hired, then you probably need an attorney um, just to level the playing field because you do not want to go to court. Um, as Billy said earlier, you know, when you're your own attorney, you're held to the same standard that the other attorney is. And he, you know, went to law school, presumably passed the bar, and you know, this isn't his only his or her only case, uh, where you know it might be your only ever time in family court. So nine times out of 10, if the other side has an attorney, I think you probably need an attorney as well. That being said, hiring an attorney or your other spouse, you know, hiring a particular attorney does not change the facts, does not change the law, but it can definitely, you want to present your case the best way you can. Um, and some judges are great with pro pers. Some judges, it's the end of the day and they, they aren't as, as gracious because they just, I mean, they don't have to be you're treated the same way as the other attorney, uh, as if you were a practicing attorney. 
So I would say you probably need an attorney if your spouse has an attorney. Yeah, I'm. You brought up a lot of great points there, and a lot of uh, there's some, some things I want to talk about in what you just said. So many times, like what you said, a, a client can come to us and say, "Hey, we want to get a divorce, and we agree on almost everything, or we're very close." And we are hired at that point to be the attorney for one person. If we've consulted with a lawyer, we are their attorney, but we are sometimes hired as their attorney to settle a case. Right. It happens a lot. Now I've seen this go both ways. I've seen it be very successful. And I would like to think that we at Modern Law do this all the time and do it with integrity. But whenever I have people come to me who've entered into an agreement under that circumstance and it's been very unfair, they heard that the lawyer was telling them certain things. So here's what you need to know under that circumstance. Whoever that lawyer is, does represent one person unless they're hired as a mediator. You cannot be both. You are either a mediator in a circumstance or you are a lawyer. And if you are a lawyer, you can only represent one party. And so at that point, if, if you are perceiving advice from that person, if you're not represented and you're perceiving advice like you're never going to get this in court or this is the way this has to be um, and it doesn't sound right or it doesn't feel good, that is a huge red flag and a great reason to go get a second opinion before you sign. I would I would agree absolutely. And, and a lot of times, you know, the media will tell you um, that they have no stake in the case, they don't care if it sells or not. It's simply not true. Most mediators are human and they care that the case settles because that makes them, you know, also a reputation as a mediator. So they will push harder sometimes, allegedly on the party that is being a bit more resistant. So um, that is why oftentimes when a case of modern law settles, settles at mediation, there's a mediator and two attorneys there. Right, yeah. So understanding um, if one spouse has a lawyer, it's very important that you understand exactly what role that person is playing. And I, I would say that's the most important thing. And then the other thing is don't sign anything you're not comfortable with and I always think if you can at least get a consultation before you finalize a divorce, it's a good idea. Unless you've got no property, no kids, nothing, you know, a walk away divorce. Um, I always think a consultation is a bare minimum of what you need for advice. I, I would agree. And even, even if you get a call from, from me and I'm, I'm, the, I'm, the opposing, I'm the opposing party, and I'm really friendly. You have to understand that it is an adversarial process and the attorney represents their clients, and, and that's it. As, as, and that's as, it. Nice, as nice as some attorneys can be, you know, an attorney that is employed by for someone else does not have your best interests at heart. Only because they can. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Only because they they can't right because they right. have someone else's. They only have one client. Right. The reason conflicts rules exist is because we have duties. And th that duty means when you hire a lawyer, they're on your side. They have to be on your side. That's the way it works. If they're not on your side, they are subject to ethical violations. So um, it can be tricky and a little confusing. And, and it really is different when a lawyer is acting as a mediator. Those duties are there are not there. Now, here's one situation that's really hard. Do I need a lawyer if my case is high conflict? These are hard especially post decree. So these are cases that go on for years and years and years. And many times people simply cannot afford to have an attorney represent them forever. What can you do? Well, kind of similar to the previous scenario, if you're in a high conflict case, um, it's usually not just because the facts are complicated. It's usually because the other side is being aggressive, right? So in a high conflict case, um, usually those parties aren't looking for an amicable, everybody walks away happy resolution. I mean, they're looking to bury the other side, right? So you need to do as much as you can, invest as much as you can um, to make sure that you do fine uh, in that case, and then future cases down the road. Uh, because once something is established in court, once the state comes into your life, makes a decision, um, it has a ruling on it, or you reach an agreement um, through a mediation or some other way, then something else dramatic has to happen to change and, and undo that ruling. It's very rarely that just the passage of time can, can uh, be enough to change um, a court ruling. So 
if you're in a high conflict matter, um, you probably don't want to hire a uh, scorched earth attorney. Um, you probably want to hire someone that can kind of, you know, defend yourself and bring sanity to the other side. Um, so yes, if you're in a high conflict matter, um, I say you'd absolutely need an attorney. I, I, I agree with you. I think the most important thing that you have in the, in that circumstance is a strategy and not all lawyers are great at this. Some lawyers are great lawyers, but they're not great at these very high conflict, you know, usually custody related, never ending cases. You need to find a lawyer that knows those cases and that can give you a strategy that you can actually execute and win long term and that can help de escalate conflict. Right. And as, as you know, as isolated as you might feel when you're going through a high conflict case, I mean, I think I can, you know, top of my mind, I can probably remember like my two most complicated, most adversarial cases, um, you know, high conflict of all time. And I can talk to the clients about what that experience was like, what worked, what didn't. Um, and, you know, in a high conflict case, there's often there's multiple third parties involved. There's multiple stages and it really can be a roller coaster. So, I mean, that's, you know, lawyers gain experience um, and it's, it's difficult to go through those cases. Um, you should uh, take advantage of the fact that your attorney has gone through, you know, a similar uh, scenario a few times. Um, it's probably the only good thing that an attorney gets out of um, you know, a horrific case like that is the experience to help the next client. Absolutely. And it's also, I mean, there are people in our office who specialize in, in, in this because it's, it's so specific. And so by hiring people or team, a legal team or people who are, who are very well-versed in very specific areas, you're going to spend less money. You don't want to, you don't want to be the case that the lawyer is learning on. So avoid that, hire an experienced lawyer. And the same thing is true for if you have, like, let's say you, you agree on most things, but you have a very, very complicated, um, you know, stock options and pension plans and, you know, complicated financial issues. Do you need an attorney under that circumstance or could you just use your financial advisor? Well, you might be able to use your financial advisor, but your financial advisor might not be intimately uh, familiar with some certain aspects of family law um, as they relate to financial distributions. So again, that's probably a situation where it's very rare that both parties are really financially savvy. Um, and then it's also, we were talking about earlier, financial advisor was probably, it was the, you know, the couple's financial advisor, but probably one party knew them first. So there's some, there's some bias there potentially, right? Um, so that's a situation where you might want to have an attorney look it over before you sign anything, like Billy said earlier, because when there's very, very complicated finances, um, one of the things I always do is I talk to my client, I'm like, okay, well, before we really dive into, um, all the, uh, all the math, all, all the, all the components of, of the financial picture, you know, what do you, what do you need to survive? Um, like, what do you think you would get just in spousal maintenance and have those conversations and then kind of reverse engineer the financial stuff? Um, because if you can save money by not going through complex financial discovery and the outcome is you're financially set for life a few times over, um, that, that's something you'd want an attorney to, to look over for you. But, um, you know, I think, I think most attorneys have financial advisors and most financial advisors have attorneys, right? So that should tell you a lot right there. I totally agree with you. I think that that is an excellent circumstance to make sure that your people are talking. You know, you've got, you've got your expert in finance who's not your lawyer. And then you've got your lawyer who can make sure that your finances are protected in your divorce. So I, I completely agree with you. That's about like being able to break your case and knowing your experts and knowing your advisors on particular issues. Next question, do I need a lawyer if I have a mediator? I would say they're probably not. Um, it depends how you got the mediator, but you know, mediator is going to push the parties towards a settlement. 
Uh, but a great, you know, a great mediator will also tell people, look, I, I cannot help you. You unfortunately need to go hire attorneys. Um, it might be a, it might be kind of a hybrid answer as well. Maybe you don't need a mediator to go, or an attorney to go to the, me, to, go to the mediation, um, but you can ask the mediator, you know, can I have some time to look over this with an attorney? Um, so some mediators uh, do not allow mm -hmm. attorneys in the room. Like if you have a mediation only practice and you can't bring an attorney, mm -hmm. uh, but they'll have a roster of attorneys that you can have your documents looked over with. Mm -hmm. So anytime you're put into a situation where you know, you have to sign a document before you leave this room and the deal is probably gone, then it's probably not the best room to be in, right? Absolutely. So you, I you totally should, agree. You should be familiar with the process before you go in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's totally true. Some people can, can mediate without lawyers and um, they have a very good grip on the consequences of the decisions that they're making and they never have to see a lawyer. Other times people go see a mediator and the mediator can tell right away there's a power imbalance or an information imbalance and the mediator will send you to an attorney. Um, there is no one size fits all. Like, you, your case is unique. Your circumstances are unique. The dynamic of your relationship is unique. And so you just have to figure out the best plan for you and know when you're in over your head. If you feel uneasy, go talk to somebody that you can trust. Correct. And, and you know, in when you reach a mediated agreement, um, there's certain language in there that says, you know, in layman's terms, you know, you weren't drunk when you signed this, you understood it, and no one put a gun to your head, right? right. Um, usually all those things are true, but you still might feel pressured and you still might just want to, might not understand, but you want the process to be over, right? Yeah. Um, an attorney can look over those things for you, point out, you know, minor or major changes that don't necessarily set the process back months or weeks or, you know, e even a couple hours um, that will pay dividends down the road. So, I'm so glad that you brought that up because there is this very real pressure that people feel to just be done. Like they just want this pain and this process and this pressure to go away. And sometimes they think by signing something that that will do it. And sometimes it works and many times it doesn't. Right. So Ryan, when can someone or when should someone use a certified um, legal document preparer or paralegal to help them with their divorce or modification? You know, I think in a number of situations, you can start with a paralegal, you can start with a document preparer and you know, maybe have a couple of consults with attorneys um, or a consult with an attorney and let the attorney know that, you know, if this gets complicated, I might give you a call. But certainly if you, uh, if you haven't seen your, your spouse in years and you're going to go by default um, or you told your spouse that you're going to or, or you're the father of your children um, that you're going to go forth with the establishment petition you're going to go forth with child support and go forth with the divorce and they say okay write whatever you want um, then you go to a document preparer and you say you know write the most advantageous divorce or establishment petition you can think of um, and you probably don't need an attorney there at all. So I would say any uncontested matter that is relatively simple, you probably do not need an attorney for it. And there are a lot of great document preparers and there are a lot of great paralegals that can get you through that process from start to finish. You will never need an attorney, um, but you know most attorneys will charge an hourly rate to look over those documents. So I guess that would be a good time to talk about when you need a you know, full scope of representation versus a limited scope. Um, so a full scope means you hire the attorney to handle your entire case. A limited scope means you hire an attorney for a very limited purpose. Maybe that's look over these documents, don't spend more than two hours. Maybe that's prepare me for my trial. Uh, you don't have to, you don't have to hire an attorney for the entire matter. Right. Absolutely. And this goes back to like your situation is yours. Sometimes people are choosing between, do I go by myself or do I get a document prepared to help me? If that's the choice you're making, you don't have the money to hire a lawyer, you're never gonna hire a lawyer, then go see the document prepare. They do work in family law, they do probably know more than you do and, they, and, they're, and they're going to be able to give you good information. Um, if you're choosing between, do I hire a lawyer to do everything for me or do I hire a lawyer to coach and consult me? Um, 
then we need to just look at your budget and figure out what can you afford? How much is at stake? What are you comfortable with? And you should be able to talk to an honest attorney who can help go through that cost benefit analysis with you. And sometimes it's not clear to lay people or non-lawyers, how much is at stake? How much am I looking at walking away from if I don't advocate properly for myself? And a good consultation should be able to help you figure that out. Absolutely. So let's see, what other circumstances are there where your people are not sure if they need a lawyer? Sometimes, like, what if I want a simple modification of child support? Do I need a lawyer for that? Probably not, but child support for a lot of people is the third rail. So opposing parties will fight it kind of tooth and nail. Um, so you might need an attorney just to shepherd you through the process. Um, but, you know, there is a simplified process that is not really shouldn't be that adversarial, but like I said, it is. Um, and there are a lot of factors to child support that can kind of you know, cause big swings, like uh, change in health insurance costs, things of that nature. So you probably do. Um, and if anything, if your, um, you know, your co-parenting is going well, but you know, money was a sensitive issue in the divorce or it's always a sensitive issue, then it might be good to have an attorney that can write, like that can correspond with the opposing party um, and, you know, spell out, you know, this is why we're seeking the modification. It's not punitive. It's just, there's a change in income, either yours or mine, and, and this is what it is. So you might want an attorney just to kind of do damage control for you. Um, yeah, so I, I, I absolutely I agree. It, it, it depends. Well, so that's, as you were saying that, I was just thinking, okay, we're, we're about at the end of our time. And unfortunately we could call this episode, it depends, <laughs> which is the most classic lawyer answer for everything. Really distinction, yeah. It depends. And unfortunately it's true. Like it's accurate. I know it's like mind bogglingly frustrating to hear it depends, which is why we expanded on why it depends for the last 30 minutes, but it really does depend. And so as you listen to this episode, think about your situation, think about the different like things that we talked about and how you, where you might fit and, right. and then get whatever help you need. Right. And I think, I think I would say that, you know, most attorneys you know, have a reasonably priced consultation and most attorneys, uh, although it does depend are pretty honest um, and attorneys don't really want to take on a case that um, the, the firm you know doesn't need to doesn't need uh, to help the client because they don't want to feel like they've you know overcharged a client for something so get a consultation um, find out you know what is at stake what you're up against um, and then you know feel comfortable with the attorney um, you should also feel comfortable that the attorney says you know you don't need an attorney um, very rarely, if the attorney could take your case um, or could not take your case, you know, they wouldn't have scheduled the consultation. So the attorneys want to help people that they feel they can help. So I would say, you know, to get to the bottom of that depend situation, um, I would definitely say just have the consultation. And one last final tidbit is do not hire an attorney who dabbles in family law. There are a lot of solo practitioners or people out there or firms who do not specialize in family law. Don't go talk to them. There's also a lot of, of family law attorneys, people who actually claim to be family law attorneys. That's what they do. Like that's who you should talk to. That's who you're going to get the best information from. So don't hire the guy that you know from church who sort of does family law. Just don't do it. I agree. Anything else, Ryan? Not, I mean, not to end it on a dark note, but certainly if your soon-to-be ex is accusing you of anything criminal, uh, anything very, very serious, any crimes against children or, you know, financial malfeasance, and you just need an attorney to set the record straight, clean your name, um, so you certainly don't want to get uh, on the wrong side of those allegations, especially, you know, if, if they're not true or they're, you know, you know expansions of, of true facts. Um, so if, if you are being faced with something serious, if someone is besmirching your good name in family court, I mean, there are certain topics that I would say you need an attorney just to do, just to put out the fire for you. I am so glad that you mentioned that because it's pretty important. And we talked about, we started this episode on the right to remain silent. And we talked about criminal proceedings. 
And um, the right to remain silent is specific to criminal proceedings, but the Fifth Amendment is what is a constitutional right to not incriminate yourself. And if you are being accused of something in family court, it could have massive, massive consequences, not only with your children, but also for your criminal case. And so I'm glad that you mentioned that because it is a big deal. And if you've been accused of something wrongly, you need to talk to an attorney. So you're, you're just a thousand percent right. Thank you. Thanks for your time today. We'll talk soon. Absolutely. Bye.